Doesn't show? Does it say it started? Your mom's watching the movie, yes. Mom? She's watching the movie. Okay. What? Thank you, dude. But there's a big crowd, a small crowd, it's always a vivid in the class, right? If you have a to the Monday night class. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Baruch Hashem, the room is full and people are still walking in, but we're going to start on time. Uh, if you're watching us online, you can share this. The world should know. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Showing your support to two brave soldiers that are with us. Showing the world that I'm Yisrael Chai. Thank you. <laughs> Second, thank you to my wife on Shorter Ways, making sure this beautiful refreshments, and to the people that are helping, to Debbie, to our security team. Um, where's your other time? Oh, okay. So, uh, a huge thank you to Yohanan and to Rochelle for being here tonight and giving up your vacation time, the one week that they have off to uh, unwind and to relax and like to forget about everything going on, to come and to uh, talk with us. And for Yohanan, I know he's not, uh, not a professional public speaker, that's the best. Can we work from the heart? And I'm sure it'll be very meaningful to us. Before we start, we have a chance to uh, hear firsthand what's going on in Israel today. A few uh, housekeeping announcements. First of all, I, I we all got on your seats these uh, flyer for a solidarity group we're doing to Israel, God willing. We can get a nice crowd on April 1st. It's obviously going to be a very well organized trip, a very secure trip with the army and with security. But this is a chance to uh, join one of the largest trips that will be taking place since October 7th, not the largest trip. Last year we were almost, I think, 800 people on the trip to go together, to show our brothers and sisters in Israel that we are with them, that we're standing with them, to go to some of the places, to go to the place of the Supernova Festival, to go there to Be'eri, to go to the soldiers, to eat and to dance together with the soldiers on the bases. So if this is something that interests you, please go on and look at it. Um, I'm glad to give you more information about the flights and the costs and the itinerary. To lead our code Chabad CS24 to uh, sign in. Secondly, we're starting tomorrow night, JLI. JLI is an amazing series. There's also flies on the seats. Uh, the next course is starting tomorrow. Is advice for life. I'm not going to give you a lovely intro right now, but I was inspired today, just tonight, for whoever's here, if you want to join the course. It'll be thirty dollars off, so it'll be sixty dollars or a hundred dollars for a couple. You can tell Karina we want at the front. You can go to the website, and uh, we'll give this kind of just for tonight, just for those of you that are here. If you want to sign up, those that are regulars, you know that it's a great course, and um, I'll let those that come speak for itself. Lastly, normally right now at eight p.m. is me and the Bible. That's what we normally do now for all the regulars that are here every Monday night at eight p.m. We take a biblical character and we analyze him. We dig deep into his life story. We go into his psyche a little bit, try to understand his character, his personality, to understand who he is or she is, what was their struggle, what was her challenge in life. And so tonight, before we start with the soldiers, I want to do three mitzvot. We know there's three pillars upon which the world stands. Torah, Tefillah, and Shadow. The three pillars upon which the world stands and the three pillars through which divine blessings come down are the pillars of study, of Torah, of prayer, and of giving charity. So I want to take one minute to teach a short Torah thought. One minute. We'll say a prayer together, and then we'll, I will want to give charity afterwards. Whatever is done, then we'll go to the soldiers in Israel. I will tell you until Hanukkah, every single week we're sending money to soldiers in Israel for a Friday night dinners. Well, sometimes one... 
group, one unit of those two battalions, had a few people helping us in Israel, Hanukkah stopped. One of my old former students was a reservist, was off duty. Stopped uh, happening, but God willing, just you guys being here, really inspiring the, uh, the need to show our support and our solidarity. So any charity given tonight will be 100% for showing support to soldiers in Israel. So one minute Torah thought about the hero of this week's Torah reading is Yisrael. Now Yisrael was not a Jew originally. He was not originally a proud Israeli. He was not originally someone who stood strong with the people of Israel. And then the Torah tells us, Vayishma Yisrael. And Yisrael heard about the miracles that happened when he heard he decided to come to join the Jewish people. What did he hear? Rashi wants to know, what did he hear? He didn't hear about the Kishka and the Chalot that we served at the Kiddush on Shabbos. <laughs> he didn't hear about the Harry. He heard about the miracle of the destruction of Egypt, the drowning of Egypt and the splitting of the sea. And he heard about the war against Amalek. And when he heard that the Jews had won these wars, how God had destroyed Egypt, and when he heard how the Jews had won the war against Amalek, that's when Yisrael decided that I'm going to come join the Jewish people. And as Yisrael says the words, Ata Yadaiti, now I know, Ki Gadol Hashem, the God of the King, that God is greater than all the other gods and all the other nations, that God, our God, is the true God. There is, sadly, a whole lot of misinformation out there, but that's a nice way of saying it, actually. I'll say it as it is. There's a whole lot of absolute ignorance out there, lots of it. Just this afternoon, I got several phone calls from very, very ignorant people. Hopefully, no one, if they can watch, let them watch. You don't have to worry about saying anything on camera, I'm not worried. I speak truth, and if you say truth, people that don't understand that there's a genocide going on, I think that uh, we're, we're, we're doing atrocity. When Yisrael heard of the war the Jewish people fought, when Yisrael heard about the fact that we fought against the Malik, and we won the war against the Malik, we didn't show restraint, we didn't show the patience, we fought to defend ourselves from those that had an unprovoked attack us. At that moment, Yisrael says, I want to join the Jewish people. So there's a lesson for us, me and the Bible, everyone that never find how can I emulate, how can I relate to a biblical character? Yisrael is a man who sacrificed a lot, politically, in his career, in his community to stand proud of the Jewish people. But Yisra did it. That's the hero of this week's story. A man who's willing to risk his own reputation, to stand proud, to stand strong, to stand publicly and courageously with the Jewish people, and to say, now I know that God is the God of the Jewish people. He's the greatest God in the world. So tonight's real objective, besides from, you're all curious to hear the story and know what's going on in Israel, for us in America, we're yearning to know more going on in Israel. But it's really to give all of us an opportunity to be like Israel. To stand strong and to say, I am proud to be part of the Jewish people. And if I'm not Jewish, I'm proud to stand together with the Jewish people to recognize the greatness of God and to recognize the greatness of the Jewish people. Okay. With that being said, <laughs> thank you. With that, thank you, baby. So we're going to do a chapter to help enjoy the Hebrew. The English is on your paper, so you can join along with me. I'll say it out loud slowly. Share, la marot, esa enai, el haharim, me'ayin, yaba, ezri, ezri, me'im adonai, osei shamayim ba'aretz. Al yitain, la marot ba'bracha, al marot ba'bracha, hinei, Lo yamun ve lo yishan shamer Yisrael Adonai shamracha Adonai tzilcha Al yadim inracha Yom ha ma'ashem ha'ashlo yakeka Ve'yereach balawa Adonai yishmarcha mikorra Yishmar es nafshacha Adonai yishmar tzilcha uvo'echa Me'ata y'ad olam A song for a sense I shall raise my eyes to the mountains From where will my help come? My help is from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to falter. Your guardian will not slumber. 
Lord, I am regarding you. There is no one slumber or your sleep. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your shadow. He is by your right hand. By day the sun will not smite you, nor will the moon at night. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your soul. The Lord will guard your going and your coming from now to all eternity. Amen. Okay, as I said before, if you want to give some charity later, there's charity boxes that you can go online. These are the pillars, the channels through which God brings blessings to the Jewish people, and especially, especially to our brave, courageous soldiers. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Yehonatan and Rachel, both who serve in the IDF, who are proud, proud Jews, courageous Jews, heroes, in every sense of the word, to please come up. And uh, we're going to have, this is an interview format because it's going to be much more comfortable. At the end, I will open up the floor to questions or moderate. We did do testing earlier. Ah, so. okay. <laughs> like, no, that's not for this. It's is just for fun. this. That's for you to share. These mics are for the Facebook. We're actually streaming. On, oops. We're actually streaming on two Facebook. Uh, my own personal Facebook page on our YouTube channel, and also Chabad.org is also sharing the stream. So that's why there's two microphones. This is for my husband who doesn't even have a Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's on YouTube too. <laughs> it's like, life is easy without Facebook. It's much easier without Facebook. Okay. Um, Thank you to Mushka, she's our tech. Uh... Okay, so I already briefly introduced Yehudatan, the group in Israel, and Rachel is actually an American born here in America who decided to make Aliyah and become a lone soldier in the IDF, which deserves a round of applause, absolutely. And just in case someone doesn't know, a lone soldier is an American or a foreigner who does not have family in Israel who makes the commitment to go join the Israeli army without having the natural support of a family, of a place to go during their weekends off. And it's every soldier is sacrificing, but to be a lone soldier is a whole new level of sacrifice. So, we, ladies first. And um, we'll start with you, Rochelle. If you could tell us briefly your story and why you decided to make Aliyah and become a lone soldier in the IDF. So first of all, I want to say thank you for having us. Um, we're not originally from Florida. I grew up in Maryland, actually. And um, in the past, I would say, five to seven years, my grandmother was living in this area. And Rabbi Denberg uh, actually, uh, how do you say it? Like you officiated, you officiated know. unfortunately, officiated uh, her funeral a couple of years ago. So we've actually found a lot of comfort in this community. So it's nice to be back. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that. Um, so I grew up in Maryland, and I grew up in the Reform uh, community. So I was in Nifty, if anybody knows that, the youth movement. <clears throat> and I all of a sudden heard about this trip to Israel in high school. And I went there for one of the first times. I also went on a bat mitzvah trip. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God, I'm 16 and this country is, is something incredible. I came home, I told my parents, I'm joining the IDF. And they laughed in my face, <laughs> just like you're doing. Um, they laughed in my face. They said, okay, 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 if you want to go, you go after college. So I listened, I went to college, and then every spring break, every winter break, I would come home, and I'd say, it's still yearning, it's still talking to me. And they would say, okay, but at the end of college, you know, we'll talk about it when you're at the end. And uh, a month after I graduated college, I made Aliyah. Um, I made Aliyah with a program called Green Zabar, which supports lone soldiers. It was a group of all of us from around the country um, that decided to do this specifically after college, specifically also kids that uh, kept Shabbat. And we moved to a kibbutz together. Uh, that was almost 10 years ago, which is really wild. Um, we all moved there and the decision to do it was, again, like I said, it was years built upon years of this feeling of this was calling to me. This was something that I felt like I had to do. There wasn't you know, a job calling for me in New York that I felt so meaningful. So that was really calling to me in the same uh, way, that was as meaningful. And I felt I couldn't continue uh, the rest of my life path without doing this first. I saw the women in the army and I, I saw a certain type of strength, especially a Jewish strength, that I couldn't see anywhere else. You know, these girls carrying these guns, I'm like, what? in what world? Um, 
So that was really the strength that I was also looking for as a young woman. I think I was really looking to feel that strength. Um, and uh, uh, what was it like to be in the Army? I was a combat engineering instructor, which uh, if anybody knows what an APC is, it kind of looks like a tank. Uh, I taught the soldiers how to drive the tank into war. Um, it was the best two years of my life. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we, you know, we live in Israel, so the, no one has as big of the car as they do here. I always tell you all the time, you have to get a white Escalade. It'll be the closest thing to my Puma. That's what it was called. You can take my SUV for a ride Oh afterwards. my God, please. <laughs> uh, so that's what I did for two years. I, I did eight months of intensive Hebrew uh, training. I didn't really have much Hebrew beforehand. I didn't go to Jewish school. And, um, and then I started instructing uh, in the Army. So that's my story. That's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, Yohanan, if you can tell us, please, where you grew up, about your upbringing. Um, I grew up in, uh, in Ashkelon. It's a, south, it's a city in the south, south part of Israel uh, for about six years, and then my family moved to a small town uh, in the area of Ashkelon. Um, I have three sisters. After school, after high school, I, I went to yeshiva for two years. Uh, I learned there and then joined the army. Which unit? Um, <laughs> combat engineering. <laughs> uh, I can't hear you. Combat, combat engineering uh, unit. That's where I met Rochelle. Um, so I, I was with her on base for um, three months, maybe. Um, then uh, I moved. Uh, up north in the Chermon, in, uh, in the Judea and Samaria, also. Um, that was my arm, army service. So, people, thank you. People always want to know how, how like, Khan and I met. That's like always the most common question. How did tell you meet? Us, tell yeah, so how did the two of you meet? Let's hear that story. It's very important. Okay, so it's important. No Jews can get together. <laughs> <laughs> it's important for me always to say that he was not my soldier. That was very important for me to, to have a distance with them. They call it the distance, but it really just means distance with your soldiers. Um, so one day, I, uh, there was an officer that asked me to borrow some equipment for the big Puma, the big truck. And he said, later on in the day, I'll have a soldier return it to you. And this was the soldier that returned it to me. Uh, you know, he was like schlepping all this stuff, and he's like, in Hebrew you say at me scan, like the poor guy, you know, he like was schlepping all this stuff, so I, I offered to help him. And um, we started talking, and I remember when he left the room, I remember being, he saying like, that would have been nice, you know, and then it kind of let, let go. I did, we didn't exchange numbers or anything like that. And then that specific Shabbat, we were staying on base, you know, you have a certain schedule in the army where you close base on Shabbat. And I remember we were at shul, and I saw him through the mechitza, and, uh, <laughs> and then I made sure as he was walking out to kind of open the girls' section and say, hey, all the time, shabbat shalom. <laughs> and, uh, and that's my side of the story. His side also, he said, after I kind of peeked my head out, he tried finding me on base throughout that whole shabbat, and he couldn't find me. So the next week, he, uh, you want to say the next one? Um, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Don't be shy. So that was Shabbat, and that was my last week on that base. Uh, before I, like, that, that was the last week of me finishing training. Um, so after that Shabbat, for the, until Thursday, when that was the last day on base, uh, I tried accidentally. Uh, accidentally. Bumping into her on base, uh, which didn't happen. Or if it happens, she always had someone with her speaking to, so uh, I didn't have the guts to, to yeah. ask her out. Um, until, uh, I think, the day before, on Wednesday, I saw her, I said hi, continued walking, and then... Wait, he walked, and then he did a circle. He really went, he passed me, he said, hey, and he comes back full around. You can see, like... <laughs> uh, that's it, and then I asked her out. And yeah. asked for her number, and two days after. Yeah, and we're going to be married for five years in May. <laughs> and my family is all there in Israel, all of our family. Yeah, your parents are watching in Israel, right? Uh, watching. They'll watch the recording, they're probably sleeping. <laughs> they'll watch out, okay. So those are the happy days, the good old days of the five years is a big number. It's like a certain, like, yeah. you made it in your marriage. You get the to the five-year point. Is that the Shem God should give you many more? Amen. Many more.
And rather they have a beautiful two-year-old daughter that's uh, sleeping, hopefully, we hope she's sleeping. Hopefully. Okay, um, but now let's unfortunately, we're not here for happy uh, conversations, unfortunately. So let's go to the morning of October 7th. Simchas Torah. They're watching? Oh, they're they're watching. My wife is controlling the Facebook, yeah. Go to sleep, mom and dad. <laughs> Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you can comment. We'll get the comments later. We'll take some questions from your comments on Facebook too. So let's go to the morning of October seventh. Simcha Torah. Go ahead. Please describe for us that morning how you experienced it from your perspective. Um, so I got up uh, early um, with our daughter, of course. Uh, Rochelle was still asleep. Uh, this one is too strong. <laughs> um, so I took her to shul, um, and on my way there, I heard a siren from not from the town that we're living in, but from a town next uh, close by. Um, and I didn't think much of it, and just continued walking to shul. Uh, I was there the whole morning for about three hours, hours, maybe a couple of hours. <clears throat> until uh, at a certain point the police came and asked like I didn't have any idea of what's happening in the country of course uh, until the police came and asked that at least one person in the area in the shul will have a phone on him on in case something happens uh, that's when we understood that something else is happening and not something usual um, so all of us just uh, took the kids and went back home at the same time, I was at home prepping to have uh, a lunch. We were having friends over for lunch. And one of the men actually didn't go to shul that morning and had knocked on my door and said, do you know what's going on in the country? He was still in pajamas. I guess one of his neighbors that didn't keep Shabbat saw them walking to shul and told them to not go outside. And so he was the one who told me uh, that something was happening in the country. And I immediately went out searching for them to bring them back home. Uh, we came back. Um, and on, on, on the way back, uh, there was someone in the, just on the street telling me, like, try to get home as quickly, quickly as you can. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know. And I, still, I didn't have any idea of what's happening. And to me, because I grew up in the South, um, I just thought it was a regular round of uh, shooting rockets from, the, from Gaza into the country. Um, and, and so Wait, I, Rob, where are we living? Where do you live? Yeah, a small town next to Ashkelon. So it's in the south? Yeah. Just south. give the geography, Ashkelon's in the yeah. south. Ashkelon's in the How south. How far are you from Gaza? Um, 20 miles. 20 miles. 20 miles. 20, 20 miles, miles from the Gaza border. Uh, 20 miles from the Gaza border. And okay. also, when, it, when it's a normal red uh, alert, how many seconds do you have to be able to run to the safe room? Where my parents live, 30, 35 seconds. Sterot uh, is the Sterot is the closest city to Gaza. Closest, big, your parents live in, in Sterot. Yeah, no, they parents. live out near so Ashkelon. My parents live in a small town next to Ashkelon. It's a place called Merkaz uh, Nothing big. Um, the big, the biggest city, big city. Uh, there is uh, the closest to Gaza is Sterot, which and is they like, have 15 seconds yeah, to run. 15 seconds. Um, but there's definitely places that are much closer. All the kibbutzim and the moshavim there were. Uh, around the Gaza Strip that took the hardest hit on uh, October 7th. Um, so throughout the day, also on October 7th, um, our friends who were by us for lunch, they did come over for lunch, but you know, we locked the doors, we didn't, again, we were told to turn our phones on to start understanding what was happening. And Yonatan was kind of like one of the most calm people because he was from the South. So he said, it's okay, you know, a couple of terrorists here, there, it happens every couple of years. Um, sirens happens, you know, he was really calm and everybody else felt something was different. And that's when I understood that it's not a normal round of uh, shooting rockets from the south. It's something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also when I turned on my phone because I waited for a call from the army to, to come. Uh, and we, we had our phones on pretty much from noon on. And, all, and slowly, slowly, our friends started texting us saying, okay, I got sent in, okay, I got sent in, I got sent in, to the reserves. Um, so we essentially, as soon as we could, packed him his reserve bags. And in the Army, everyone around the age, up until the age of about 40, 45, 
uh, is signed up for reserves. So every, every, at least once a year they do a training from a couple of days to a week or two just to stay fresh um, when it comes to using their guns and, and certain te uh, techniques. And so we always have a bag packed for him just in case he has to go. Um, and we were, we were nervous, but once we started seeing what was happening in the news, it was frightening. Uh, it was really frightening. I'm sure many of you it saw. Definitely wasn't a normal, yeah. regular round of shooting rockets. Yeah, rockets. and this and this was happening live. I mean, we're watching the news, and you're hearing um, you're hearing live on the radio people that are stuck in their safe rooms right in the right outside Gaza, saying the terrorist is is holding the door. He's trying to come in. Where is someone? Why am, why are we alone? Or uh, they they've, they've killed my. Neighbor. How am I going to get, I mean, you were, you were hearing these live stories, you were seeing the girls in live time uh, being taken, you know, the, I'm sure you've seen the, the famous video of Naam Alevi um, being taken from that, that truck, and we were seeing this live, and we had no idea where they were going to come from. So it was terrifying, we had no idea how long he was going to be going for, and we just waited for hours to get the call, to get the call, to get the call and not going outside. And we finally decided to lay our heads down at 2 a.m. And he got a call at 2.05. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we also had friends that lived about 15 minutes away. Her husband specifically didn't go into reserves because he's in a full-time military position uh, in an office. And so they said, we'll come and we'll stay with you until he goes, you know, so that you at least aren't alone during this time. And we thought that he would be gone maybe for, for two weeks, the last real war, which technically wasn't a war, it was an operation, it was in 2014, and it was a month. So we didn't think much of it, and the bag that he had was very small. Um, little did we know, he'd be away for four months. Um, and, uh, and then he left, and I called my parents, who were on FaceTime, and they made Aliyah two years ago. And I said to them, they were in Jerusalem, and they had been experiencing sirens from the morning. And um, I said, you need to come to us so that you're not alone for this. And again, I thought they would maybe move in with me for a week so that we could all be together. And they pretty much moved in with us for the last four months. Um, gave them my bedroom. <laughs> and uh, me and my daughter, Claire, slept in the safe room. And we saw Yonatan once every once a month. And a week ago, yesterday, he was released from Gaza. A week ago, yesterday. That's last Sunday. That's yeah. nine days ago. Yeah. Last Sunday's in Gaza. Okay, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind sharing personally, when you went and you said goodbye, what was that goodbye like? Um, it was uh, in the middle of the night, as she said. And... It was the first time going into reserve that wasn't for training, so that was different. Um, I was con I was confident in myself and in the army, and I knew um, that everything was going to be okay. Uh, it was harder than I thought because of the because of our daughter uh, that she was asleep and. Uh, you didn't say goodbye to her. No, she was asleep and I didn't want you to kissed her. Up. her. Yeah, you kissed her. I'll give her a kiss. Um, I think there was a sense of, um, there was fear, but there was a sense of, you have to go. Yeah, you, this is really like, if our army wasn't, I, we were waiting with such anticipation because I think it was, you have to take part in protecting our people now. You know, this was, this wasn't just rocket fire. This was a real attack. Was our friends raising? <laughs> um, uh, this was um, this was go out and get the bad guys, really, and uh, and so I think that it was a mix of, of sadness but also pride, pride. Beautiful. And what was the feeling amongst the troops when you were called for reserve? You're sitting waiting for two weeks or so until you guys actually went into Gaza. Uh, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. What was the feeling like amongst the troops? What was the morale? So I can speak to the guys around me. Um, so we were actually for about two, two and a half months uh, waiting to be called in. Uh, we, were, we were called into reserve and for the first uh, two, two and a half months we were training basically. Um, we didn't go in. 
the army is big. We, they called 350,000 uh, um, reserve soldiers to come in, and now all of them together went into Gaza. But we will say that this was the first time in Israel's history that this amount of uh, reserve soldiers volunteered to come back after also two years of a lot of uh, divide in the country. Um, so everyone came back and everyone, no matter who you were, what age, what background, um, everybody was coming to, to protect the country. So to answer your question, the morale was very high. Okay. Um, everyone came with the... Uh, um, came because they understood that they need to be there and everyone needs to be there. Um, and yeah, that was it. So if you don't mind, describe to us the average day. You're going to Gaza. <laughs> I, there's no average day in Gaza. I get that, but give us like a, some kind of estimation of what, what goes on. Where are you sleeping? Where are you eating? What, like, what's it like to be a soldier in Gaza? So again, I can speak only to myself. Yeah, we want your personal experience. The, the people around me. Um, so just to get the idea, uh, you're going into a place that is full of destruction. You see nothing around you. Um, you see roads are not roads anymore. And you see no one walking in your area, at least not supposed to be. Um, and that means no electricity, that means no running water, um, the food and whatever they have is what you get once every few days um, uh, that gets sent in with uh, trucks and... Uh, convoy. Yeah, convoy. Mm -hmm. That's the word that I looked for. Convoy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry. <clears throat> so we were in the middle, middle of Gaza, my unit. And our average day, I would say, would be, um, that was after the entire army came in, uh, came in from the north and went all uh, the way up to the bottom third of Gaza. And we came in after that to control an, to control an area that was already cleared from, uh, like, all the citizens uh, uninvolved, as they like to say, citizens. Um, that walked uh, down to the southern part um, and the only people who were still there were Hamas terrorists and and our mission would have, I would say would have been uh, that every day to scan an area for Hamas or other terrorist groups infrastructure meaning launching pads uh, rocket launching pads um, houses of terrorists uh, tunnels, um, armor, uh, armor, like rockets, RPGs, hand grenade guns, um, to find and destroy all of that. The the house that they moved into, there was essentially a, a home that you know no one was uh, no one was in anymore, and it was of a Hamas terrorist. And in you know like you see the stories, but to hear it from him, he said you know the the room of the high school girl had posters of Hamas everywhere, like it was a boy band. And uh, underneath her bed it was? There were in a different room in the house. Different room? A, a box full of hand grenades, RPG. Under the, in the bedroom? In the yeah. bedroom. In, the, in bedroom. the bedroom. And this was the house he was staying in. So were you yourself inside any of the tunnels? Or only certain groups? Uh, so the start of the, like after the war started, Hamas knows how the, um, the IDF is working, so anything that they, uh, they uh, are doing. If it's tunnels, the entrance to the tunnels, entrance to houses, so they... Uh, booby trap. Uh, booby trap, yes. Um, so the army said, as a rule, we're not going into any tunnels, we're um, destroying everything from the outside. So yes, at a month and a half, two months that I was there, um, we had missions that were as I said, to scan and f try to find uh, tunnels, and uh, and the few that we found, we destroyed without going in. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these are tunnels that I mean would really like snake around an entire village. You would have never know. You know, it's not a straight through kind of from house to house. These are uh, intense, intense tunnels throughout a whole city. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a tough question: Is there any particular mission 
that you were involved with, any particular operation that you could share with us the specifics? Um, to share the specifics. Um, well, every, I think I can share most of the specifics. Um, every mission was, as I said, to scan an area, went into a neighborhood that you try to find, either in houses, I said, um, or in armor, mm -hmm. and, uh, or uh, try to find for uh, um, tunnels. Um, so yeah, one day we went into one of the towns and my group of soldiers uh, mission was to, to scan a row of, like a whole street of houses. Um, so you scan and you go into the first house and you're trying to, like you're basically looking through everything in the house. Um, see so the first house we didn't see anything besides, like as she said before, like posters and signs of Hamas and uh, pictures, like it's uh, heroes, so that heroes and, uh, of, uh, of the Hamas leaders in the houses. So the first one, two, three houses, like that's all we found. And then in the last one uh, that we went into, um, we scanned and before we almost left the house as if we didn't find anything. Um, so and un like underneath the staircase, uh, on the way out, we saw a door that we didn't see before. And it was uh, basically a whole room of as I said, hand grenades, RPG rockets, guns, and... So what happens to these hand grenades and these rockets? Destroy you, find, them. you destroy them. Yeah, so at the start of the war, um, some of those the army took out to learn and to understand how to, how to fight against it. Uh, but my <coughs> common engineering unit is basically to destroy when they say to destroy infrastructure of Hamas, that means to destroy the tunnels, it means to destroy houses, and it means to destroy um, all that stuff. All that that means. So that means we found <coughs> it. Why, why would the army not want those uh, RPGs and those... To use it? Yeah. Because well, we're not using something like that. I got it. <laughs> they don't, they don't we're not using uh, RPGs and... With the guns and, uh, or... Like, we have the standard, whatever we, we have from uh, <coughs> 16 or... Uh, regular guns. Um, the IDF is not using. Um, they're meant to kill. No, kill. Uh, I don't know if that's. No, uh, no just. It's not something we're using. Uh, there's no reason to uh, take it. So, just to clarify, so you come into a house, you find these RPGs, you just blow it up right there, you take yeah. them to so like a you, special you place. You take it to, uh, to a safe distance from the, uh, the forces in the area. And you destroy it. Yeah. Explosions. Explosions. So you're hearing explosions day and night, probably, right? Yeah. yeah. And the, I will say the, the, the latest kind of tragedy of the 21 soldiers who were killed, they were doing exactly what Yonatan was doing. And when I, I asked him, you know, does it feel like it could have been you? He said, yeah, we were doing that yesterday. It was just luck. Um, so You're referring to the 21 soldiers who were preparing houses to be demolished. Yeah. Yes. So they go in, they put in all of the explosives. And just by chance, Yonatan said, just by chance, there wasn't a terrorist that was near us that um, set off the explosives that we set off. But that was just a matter of luck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, it, is there any, uh, do you, did you lose any friends or family? Is someone close to the lost uh, family or friends? Um, in the war itself, um, I have someone from my unit uh, who died, who was, were kill, was killed. During, um, while you were in the war itself. itself. Um, Do you want to describe how he was killed, if you don't mind? Um, they were in, uh, not a base, but like in an area that their unit set up camp uh, for the, their time in the, um, inside. And unfortunately, there was a tunnel that the opening of it was in the middle of the camp. And a group of uh, terrorists came out. Okay. And, they uh, they were they managed to kill the Hamas terrorists. Uh, I think it was six of them. But before the before they uh, did it, one of the guys uh, died. Uh, and that that was in the war itself. But um, on October seventh, I have not very close friends, friends that I grew up with. But I wasn't in touch with them for the past several years. 
Uh, I had uh, five friends that I grew up with who died in the five uh, friends. That were yeah, in the uh, in the party, and I had one of my soldiers. He's from a kibbutz in the area, of, like in the Otef, in the Gaza Strip area. And at a certain point in the start of the war, when like every few days they published new names of uh, people who died uh, from the October 7th attacks. Um, he said, like, I asked him, like, so do you have new people that you know of that died? At a certain point, he said, I stopped ca ca counting because mm -hmm. um, all of his friends, he's from one kibbutz, and all of his friends is kibbutzim and mushavim in the area. And uh, yeah, one of my soldiers were. Wow. I'll also yeah. add um, our friend, uh, my friend from work. Um, her husband was killed the day of, as a soldier, he ran into one of the kibbutzim. He wasn't supposed to be there. No one assigned him to be there. He just started driving when he heard about what happened and was immediately killed. And they were supposed to get married in, in April. And, and this could have been, I mean, thank God he is alive. Our brother-in-law, his uh, second, second oldest sister's uh, husband, was actually a vendor at the Nova party. He provided um, reusable cups. He does them for, for big parties and venues. And he was there. and. He comes not from the south, but he comes from uh, Hebron area. the area of Hebron, and he's very, very sensitive, you know, to sounds. He's, also an, officer he's also an officer in the army. He's on the Lebanon border right now, and um, and he said, "I just felt something wasn't right." You know, even when I got to the party, I thought to myself, uh, "How could they have a party so close to Gaza?" You know, like there were like so many questions that he was starting to ask himself, and at about six a.m. He said to his friend who came with him, his, his business partner, he said, I think we have to go. I just have this feeling, I think we need to go. He started hearing you know, some of the rockets coming over and they ended up driving away, pausing to watch the sunset and then as they were, sunrise. sunrise, as they were watching the sunrise at you know, 628, as they all say it was around 628 in the morning, they started seeing big clouds, black smoke and they just started hearing yeah, hearing shooting from, from, from close by. Um, and they were saved by, I mean, really minutes, 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 minutes. And he immediately drove home and got on uniform, and he's been on the border of Lebanon ever since. Wow. So, you know, I'm going to go back to the soldier in the unit that died. What happens when the soldier in the unit dies? Is there like a the unit mourning? Do they like go on like nothing happened? What's the. Um, I wouldn't say going like nothing happened, uh, but you don't really have the option to really mourn uh, when you're at war. Um, so I would say that the last day after, like the last day that we knew that we were coming out, so on our way to, uh, to the border to come back into Israel, uh, so they had a small ceremony where he died. Um, was that emotional? What? Was that emotional? Did the, sol shoulder, did the soldiers share the emotions or everyone's tough and it's very... Well, that was actually not there because um, again like my battalion was divided into four five different uh, units that went into different areas. So that guy who was uh, killed he was in a different group. So that group when they came outside they did the cer ceremony mm -hmm. but for us they did another ceremony that uh, the night before I flew in here, uh, we had a whole night of, a whole day of basically processing of what happened inside and, uh, and uh, at the end of it, it was a ceremony for, uh, for the soldier with his family who came and uh, yeah, it was emotional. Wow. Okay, so you're in Gaza and you're seeing the inside, like what it's really like, what the civilians, the civilians are there and the terrorists there. What is an experience that you had in Gaza that you wish us Americans could see? That, first of all, their entire life could have looked completely different if they would have done, with the money that they're getting, good things. Um, it looks like heaven, uh, Gaza. So it, it looks like heaven. It's a beautiful place, yeah. It's a beautiful place, Gush Katif. Uh, uh, and and unfortunately, they're not doing anything with what they're getting in order to make their life better. Um, 
Hamas takes away the humanitarian aid that comes in. They shoot at people who are coming. The, citizens, the civilians who are trying to get the humanitarian aid, they start shooting at them. Um, I hear you. So, for Americans here, and a lot of Americans have to just think that Israel is killing innocent civilians, just murdering everyone in Gaza, and committing genocide. What would you respond to that? The, even as an Israeli that um, grew up and lived my entire life in Israel, so I always heard the, what, uh, what Israel is saying to the world, um, that every time uh, that Israel is attacking inside Gaza, so they're putting up flyers in the area that they're going to attack and warning everyone to go out of that area. So as everyone, I was never in Gaza. I never knew if that's true. Um, and the first day that we, did, we went into Gaza and we went on our first mission, I saw those flyers. Um, and we're, whatever the world, the Israel tells the world is true. It's Israel, the IDF tries everything uh, uh, in its power to, 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 do, to not hurt um, civilians. civilians. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. But so let me, just today I got uh, some phone calls of is the army is committing genocide and they're killing innocent people. So obviously Hamas is embedded within the civilian population. I get that. But do you feel that the people in Gaza could do more to protect themselves, that they, if they wanted, they could? Would you say that the people in Gaza are complicit with Hamas? Is Hamas just taken over? And um, I think every person, I'm saying it as my uh, personal personal opinion, opinion. Um, every person has the, um, has the ability to control his life and to decide whatever he wants for himself. And the same way that for the past how many years in Israel um, there was protests about everything and everything uh, in Israel, also people in Gaza can do something to change uh, their uh, um, their uh, direction in life, and they can appoint a different group of uh, people to control and govern the city of Gaza, and. I think there's something to what Yonatan's saying, but I also think we have to understand that we're not talking about a normal political group. We're talking about a terrorist organization. So um, the I don't know how much choice you know the innocent Palestinians really have in being able to separate themselves from it. I don't know. Um, the things that we know is that Israel does not we didn't want this war. We've never wanted a war. That's why we're called the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, not offense. Um, we didn't want this war. And unfortunately, as many times as, as anybody can say it, Hamas is putting their civilians in danger when they, put, when they put their launching pads underneath the hospitals and underneath schools. We can't say it enough. So unfortunately, uh, the people are put in, in horrible situations, and if one of the goals for um, this war specifically was to obliterate Hamas, who came into Israel and simply massacred innocent civilians, so uh, yeah, it has to do whatever it can to, to take away these terrorists. Hi, I need to add something. Yes. On October 7th, it wasn't Hamas that came in Israel. Mm. October 7th was people from Gaza who came into Israel. It was a Hamas plan. Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah plan to do that. Hezbollah had the same plan to do it in the north, and for some reason Hamas decided to uh, do it um, earlier because I know they saw a group of people partying on the mm -hmm. border, so they decided to do it earlier. Uh, but it was the people from Gaza who went into Israel, and there's recordings of of uh, an uninvolved civilian from Gaza who went in, and he's calling from an Israeli phone to his parents and proudly saying. I killed with my bare hands 10 people now, and his parents are very proud of him. That's not Hamas. That's uh, a, a, an innocent civilian that had the ability to control his life and do whatever he wanted, and he decided to do what he did. So it wasn't Hamas who came in, and 
Also, the idea of since then, since we're inside, there's a, an entire um, path from the north to the south, which is a humanitarian uh, path that any any uh, citizens are still in the northern part of Gaza that is basically supposed to be cleared by now uh, uh, by the army. That's a path that people can walk and go from the north part to the south part and not get uh, hurt by anyone. Um, and people are going from the north, like pe the, the civilians who want to control their life and have a different fortune in life are going to the south and trying to find their way outside of Gaza to, uh, to countries to create a new life in different countries and uh, abroad. Okay, I'm gonna leave that for now. I have more questions, but I'll leave that. Now, my last question, and I'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience. One last question, I will take questions from the crowd. What gives you hope and courage and strength when you're in Gaza? What is keeping you going? Uh, I'm asking yourself the same question afterwards. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the fact that I'm a, a Jewish person and I'm looking at uh, the history of the Jewish people and the fact that for the first time in the last 2,500 years, uh, we have a land, we have a country, we have an army, and we can defend ourselves. Okay. Michelle, what's keeping you going? What's giving you hope and strength in these Beautiful. Okay, we'll take some questions from the crowd. First, we have your answers. Yes, yes. you be the first one. I have a question, though. Just in terms of how many Gazans, is that how you say it? How many would you say were Hamas on October 7th? And how many, what percentage? You can't really tell. Can't yeah, tell. Exactly. But there was a big percentage of that were peasants mm -hmm. that infiltrated and harmed yeah. Israelis. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't have the numbers though. You don't have the number, but there's a big percentage. Yeah, definitely a lot of human numbers. Yes. So, um, yes, go ahead. I've been in Gaza many years ago, and it's a beautiful place now. The terrorists penetrated Israel to 34 different points from Gaza to Israel. What was happening? For eight hours, they did whatever they wanted. They killed, they raped, they burned people alive. What was happening? I'll read the question. I mean, I don't know if you know the answer, but where was, oh, where was the army on October 7th? It's a question every Israeli was asking. And it's still asked. It's still being asked. Correct. It's a question that the army has to answer. Well, if you want to say something to that, I, I don't have any official answer. I'm not a representative of the army. I'm here to represent myself and my wife. <laughs> um, and everyone is still asking that question. And as anything in the army, anything that happens in the army, even not at war times, but even on a day to day in training and whatever, if you hurt yourself from a pin and you bleed a little bit, so the army. Uh, research it and try to find what we did wrong, how we can do it better, and set up rules to how to act from now on. So I assume, I, I'm not assume, I know for sure that after the war, even now maybe already, yeah. the army is researching and trying to understand what went wrong that day, uh, what the army could have done better. Uh, but from what I, what I know from from people is that as you said, it's 34 different points that they infiltrated from, and the, the army was there, um, but there weren't enough people. We, they weren't prepared for such an attack, and the army, the army who was there, acted, but there wasn't enough problem. I'll, I'll add, it's the one question that everyone is asking in Israel. You hear the radio, you turn on the radio, it's almost too much to handle because uh, the answer at this point is, we can't deal with that question now, we're gonna deal with it when the war ends, which isn't a good answer. It's not a good answer, um, but that's what we're all waiting for. We're well, all waiting for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but your question oh, yeah. is a question that every, every Israeli is asking. Yeah, someone's responsible. And they're many people, there's not, one, and there, and there's not one answer. There's many parts right. to, not enough soldiers, lack of intelligence, yeah. the concept. There's many different components that all, right. I will share though, my friend who I mentioned before, my friend who unfortunately lost her, her fiance, 
she said she actually, it's very hard for her to hear that question because he was one of the people that went in. And we don't know all those stories because no one was there to witness what they saw. So I think the only thing I can at least give from what she shared with me is even though we're asking those really hard questions, is to remember there were some strong, very brave people that did go in. And I think that's something that we have to try and remember when we have those difficult questions. Uh, because there were people that, that went without question. There were, we have a, a distant cousin that took a tank from a base without permission and drove on the regular highway to go save. There are individuals. As a system, it was failed. Uh, but there were very strong individuals. And that's what we have to, uh, that's what we have right now. Okay, next. Brenda, yes. So my, my question to you is, I, I, can't even, I can't even imagine what it's like to be you, and I think like you have to be in shock. But I think as a Jewish person with an involvement in Israel, but being say in Coral Springs, Florida, um, this Jew hatred in the world has shocked us all. And how nobody is standing with Israel or the women's groups who are not standing with the women who've been raped. Yeah. Nobody is speaking out, not Michelle Obama, not celebrities who come, come to the Me Too issue. Everyone's talking right now, the buzz, yeah. in case you don't know it, no, it's about Barbie. It's about the movie Barbie, mm -hmm. and that, no, this is yeah, what you're yeah. talking about. Every, every voice. Barbie, the, the Margot, not her last name, the Margot. actress, did what? not get, um, is not nominated for an Oscar, mm. but she didn't um, deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and, the, and the woman director um, also didn't deserve it, but Ken, Brian the Gosling, who got an uh, 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 Oscar nomination. They're saying all this buzz about those women being mistreated. What if, where is everyone yeah. talking about the women in Israel? Excellent question, Brenda. They're not going to have the answer to that, but <laughs> I'm with you. It's, okay. I, I, yeah. We're with you. We listen. Israelis, I think, are more also just as shocked as you are as what we're seeing around the world. I think the only thing that helps us understand is the more we understand our history and how much hatred we've had. That's the only thing that explains it. It's like year, you know, 50 years later after that, is that, it's the only thing I can say. There's a deep, deep, deep hatred of Jews, and it's always been there. And unfortunately, we've gotten really comfortable, especially someone I grew up in the States, we got really comfortable feeling like we're like everybody else. And we're not like everybody else, and no one's ever going to look at us like we're, as much as they say that they are. Um, years ago, we were talking about how at Me Too, uh, there were people like Linda Sarsour being, uh, being honored there, and people were saying, look at Linda Sarsour's background, and no one was listening. So, unfortunately, now we, have to, now we have to listen. I think the only thing we can do, I don't live in the States anymore, is get closer to your Jewish community however you feel you can, because that's going to be who's with you. And for your children and your children's children, I really believe, I grew up in these communities, the only people that have reached out to me for my friends back at home or my friends from Jewish Youth Group, Hillel in college, these organizations, because the Jews are finally feeling it. Um, and I think the stronger you know you have a community around you that feels the same way, that's the only way you're going to get through it. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. Good answer. Yeah. Very good answer. Yeah, right. I'm also watching the Facebook. If I want to comment on my Facebook, we can look at that too. Yes, yeah, go. So, first of all, you're the Joshua of our times. Thank you. Thank you. I repeat, you are the Joshua of our times. Yes, yeah, go on. Um, you, you don't have to answer these questions, of, you know, because they're not some of this sensitive private information, but from what you're saying and from what we're seeing, so you, you, all these places where taken and then you're surveilling them to make sure that there's no terrorists left and then around you you have the army moving forward and safe zones and stuff like that so my first question is how are they hiding these hostages still these hundred and some people how are they hiding them that's number one and I'm not sh and and then you don't have to comment or answer but I just saw that there's some type of a new deal that's going in front of the Israeli legislature mm -hmm. that for 5,000 
murderers, monsters, to release 45 hostages with still leaves, 55 there, or some, I don't know what the numbers are, and, and they want a 45 day ceasefire. So, it's a five part question. The last part of the question is, <laughs> when they had the first, because you're there, that's why I'm asking these questions. When they had the first ceasefire for 30 days or whatever it was, do you feel that that did anything to the Army's advantage? And it's just a big loaded question and you can answer Let, let me, if you don't mind, so we think the last part of the question I think is a good question. No, no, no. Do you think that the Army got set back? Because the rest is all more of a political question, which is... Do you think that the army suffered... Uh, the hostages is a question. Okay, so well, there's two questions. Here. One, how, how is the army not... How is Hamas still hiding hostages if the army's been in there so long? Such a manpower. So first of all, the entire um, southern part of Gaza is still not touched. Khan um, Yunis, the town area, um, that's where the IDF went in in the past few weeks and and I would assume that that's where the the kidnapped and uh, killed the uh, uh, Israelis and hostages uh, are located and again the they most of the army the war now was an underground war um, meaning the entire um, entire mission is to, this, when we say to destroy Hamas infrastructure is mostly tunnels because they have basically an underground city. Um, so I, I would assume that the hostages are over there. Um, regarding if it's a good, uh, if it's a good, uh, if it's good for the army, the ceasefire, so my personal opinion, definitely not. Because Why would you say that it's not good for the army, the ceasefire? Because on every every day that you give them a ceasefire, it's another day to, to get arranged, and that's ten ten more soldiers that could kill be killed the day the day after. And that's a real problem. The army is scared of the ceasefire, and we're still doing it. Yes, yes, you no, no. What's what's in Gaza like on Shabbos? Do you guys get to daven, to rest, to celebrate? Mm -hmm. Also, how's Hanukkah? Do you let them know and celebrate all that? Or? So we celebrate Hanukkah. We we went in. I think it was the first night. Um, actually, my soldiers. It's a group of a uh, group of guys that came from yeshiva together um, to join the army when they were in uh, their shavuot. Uh, like your like, uh, normal first, service. The normal service. And then after they uh, were released, they joined the reserve, my unit, uh, all together. So all of my soldiers are religious guys from yeshiva. Your whole entire unit is all religious? Uh, not my small group of guys, which is like 25 to 30 guys. Uh, they're all religious. Um, and as, lo as long as you, you don't have something that you're doing now, so you have, your, like, you, you can do whatever you want, meaning. You can dive in, and they have dive in so, uh, minion, and yeah. So, how many soldiers are religious in the army? Or at least, I don't know, like statistics, but in your, your entire unit is all, I think that people are underestimating how many religious, uh, I think, I know that people are underestimating how many religious soldiers there are in the army and how much the religious community is supporting the yeah, army as part of it. So, so I would say I'm not going to look at my small group of the 25 to 30 people because uh, they're all religious. All religious. Uh, but out of the entire battalion, which is like almost 400 uh, soldiers, I would say that at least 150, 200 are religious. Then you have more uh, Masotim, which is like traditional. traditional. And yeah. And I also so, says that's important to that, yes. There's a statistic that says that um, the majority of like officers that go to officer school are, are religious. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just interesting. Okay, yes. So as an Israeli, what's the end yet? What do you hope for? You eliminate Hamas and is it you know with the, the Gazans who live there? Would someone gonna step into that vacuum and be just as malicious. How do you, 
what once you win, how do you sustain winning? What's the, the hope for peace for the Um I can say whatever I heard. I don't know what's going to be the, the end game at, uh, at the end. Um, but the way, what I understand is that the armies, the country is trying to basically destroy any Hamas infrastructure, meaning Hamas terrorists, any armor that they have, tunnels, all those stuff. Um, and then maybe set um, temporary bases, camps in Gaza. Um, for the next uh, few years, I don't know, to let the people go back in, start their life again, maybe start start a new government or whatever. And then at a certain point that Israel thinks that uh, it's safe enough to go out now, uh, that's why I understand it's rumors. I, don't know, I have no idea what's actually going to well, happen. I, I'm not asking about the government policy. You live there, you're a citizen. What well, would you wish well, what would I wish for? Yeah, what you as a person. What's your personal hopes? My personal uh -huh. hopes are is that um, Gaza is going to be, again, part of Israel. Um, meaning, uh, if anyone from the people who live there until now wants to stay, he's more than welcome if he's uh, willing to live under the law of Israel um, and not hurt anyone, <laughs> uh, like a normal citizen in any country. Um, and whoever wants to leave to start a new life in a different country is also welcome. And uh, that's it. Excellent. Right. So you're getting a lot of love on Facebook, but someone commented, they heard that maybe the hostages will move to Egypt. Is that a possibility? You think it's possible? You don't know. No, no one knows. Anything's possible. No knows. Okay. I think two more questions, maybe. Yes. Um, it might be personal. Gaza now between you, yourself, you and your spouse, like do you have that family dynamic figured out yet? It was uh <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the question was that like emotionally, psychologically, leaving Gaza, how are you feeling about going back to being married and like living in a normal life in the whole right that your question? And like yeah. going back to the regular life a little bit in the meantime. First only in the meantime, because right, I feel like it's difficult. The war's not over, so it's, it's, it's a good whatever. question. And since it's very uh, fresh, we're still uh, going through it. Um, to me personally, with myself, it's it's uh, it's insane to come from um, a place like that where it's either silence you hear or bombings. Um, you don't see anyone around you besides the soldiers with me uh, that are with me 24/7, and coming back to civilization and uh, parties with friends and, uh, and seeing life happening. Uh, it's difficult, but it's going to take time. The uh, Army, I can imagine, is giving support and yes. no counseling. So that day, no that day before, the day that I, I flew in here, um, so that day that I said that we had a ceremony and everything, it was a whole day that was basically after the Army learned from past experiences after um, all the other, all the operations that we had in the past with uh, post-trauma and everything. So it was a whole day of um, talks and sharing and speaking to uh, psychologists and uh, trying to find, to find the people that need more help in the future. And uh, yeah. And on the other end, um, there's been a lot of resources for the women um, throughout this time. No, so there's been a lot. I mean, I, I created a WhatsApp group for about 30 women that I just personally know from my circles, but there's, I mean, tens of, th uh, tens of groups um, that send us, whether it be like um, discounts on so many different types of things, whether it be psychologists or whatever it is, they have webinars about how to um, accept your, like to bring your husband back home, how to, how to identify whether or not he's having difficulty um, how to reconnect them with their children. I mean, the, the side of the women has been so interesting. There's a lot of like, you know, SNL, so they have like a similar thing, like parody uh, videos about how the women have been like dealing with this time. But uh, there's been a lot of resources. So even the other day we went to Marshall's 
And he was having a moment of like, I don't want to buy anything, you know, like I, I don't need anything. And I said, just go outside, take some time to just write to yourself, you know, and come back in. And I think we're going we're gonna to be taking a while to process it. And also knowing that there's potentially another war with Lebanon coming. And uh, we'll be ready if it happens, you know. Well, okay. <laughs> yes. Last question. Yes. Last question. Anyone can get a question? Yeah. He's so Yeah. No. That, So let me start you. So what would you say to the people that think that you're doing genocide by taking, by living in land that's part of Israel? By, by reacting that it's part of Israel. Part of like, biblical Israel, part of what was Israel until 2005. Israel. Right, 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 right. So how would you respond to people that say that you want to live in, in, in this land? How would you respond to that? We're going to have different answers. So you start. These are so. Can you start? Um, it's definitely not genocide. It's definitely not genocide. That's that's my. I mean, I don't. I mean, it's logical to me that, that yeah. people that want to live there in peace and be together with Israel. Yeah. It's a, it's a logical thing. But you know, yeah, there's always this concept of the right of return type of thing. Of course. Listen, I, that's why Yonatan and I are a little bit different. If 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 you were to ask me what my ideal situation is, I would say. Let them keep Gaza. I don't want Gaza. I don't want Gaza. I don't want that area. It has such negative energy to me anyway. You want to be there? Be there. But there can't be terrorists there. So whatever that means. Um, Personally, yeah. I, if I was looking at Israel, I wouldn't want any decisions about Gaza made until Hamas is destroyed. Yeah. Well, so, so that, and, that, and that's what Israel has been avoiding that conversation over the day after. Because as long as Hamas is still an active threat, as long as they're still holding our brothers and sisters as hostages, our only goal and objective has to be to kill them. Whether or not Jews have a right to live in the land of Israel, I can't not put it on the record that as Jews we believe that we are entitled by God to our land. So whether or not the world likes it or not, it's really irrelevant because God gave it to us. And that has to be stated on record, on camera. It's our land. God gave it to us. And that's really the end of the Okay, let's, last question, and then you want to tell Rochelle not going away, they'll take, they can sit and talk. Again, I want to really, 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 no, really thank, thank, you. You thank you for being here, spending the night with us. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you for being, thank you for being a rabbi that allows a conversation like this to be had. It's really well, important. it's important. Very important. Last question. Last question. Series. If you want to join us on our solidarity, solidarity trip to Israel, if you want to donate to send.
food for Shabbat for the soldiers. I'm going to conclude with a prayer, and with that we'll say thank you and a good night.